to like spend more time on an app. Yeah. And I, I tell this story because I, I don't think it's particularly unique to me. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of extremely talented designers out there in the world who want to make a difference, who are just simply working on the wrong problems. Um, they're working on the more problems. Uh, they're, they're trying to figure out how to get you to buy more stuff on Amazon, how to get you to do like more TikTok dances, uh, how to get you to watch more ads. And you know, I'll admit there, there's merit to these jobs, uh, but I don't think they have the same impact as like working on problems for public good for society. Because um, when you're focused on the public good, you can, you can have a real impact on your neighbors, your community, the country that you live in. And, and that's really at the heart of our mission inside Design at OGP. You know, we we want to have the biggest impact on the greatest amount of people through design. And we want to make design within the public service like so undeniably good and so appealing that amazing designers actively choose a career in public service over the likes of like Meta, ByteDance, Amazon, Apple, Google, and so on. Um, <clears throat> Because today, governments aren't really known for good design, and, and we want to change that narrative. You see that, like, that one over there is, uh, even when they're saying something is good about designing government, they're still telling you it's bad. Like, that, that's what the narrative's like. Um, so my, my hope for this evening is that we plant the seed of an idea in your mind, that, that good design and government services can and should go together. Uh, we know it's a big change, and we've still got a long ways to go. But you know, like every journey step starts with a single step. And tonight, Kalita, Stacy, Karina, uh, they're gonna be sharing about a couple of the steps that we've taken so far at OGP. And hopefully by the end of the night, you'll feel a bit inspired like I did when I first joined OGP. And the, the dream of that ambitious young designer from 2006 with a giant red Afro to, uh, to change the world with design finally started to become a reality. Uh, so Sam, did you wanna introduce the next one or just go ahead? Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, also for sharing that picture of you with the red <laughs> afro You're for all, all of the internet now. Um, and also thank you for setting the stage for us before we learn more about OGP's projects. Um, and again, if you have any questions uh, for the Q&A, please share them in the pigeonhole. Uh, we'll get around to them after the talks. Please help me welcome our next speaker, Karina, to the stage. We'll be talking about Regime SG and inclusive digital voucher system for the Singaporean government. Thank you. Okay. I just pressed something. Whoops. <laughs> Hi, testing. Okay, so it's okay. Hi everyone, um, I'm Karina. I'm a product designer and I've been in OGP since July last year. And I've been mainly working on Redeem SG, which is a digital voucher system for the Singapore government. And today I'll be sharing how we came up with this um, workflow that was like, especially that was um, that was more inclusive to the elderly, uh, to the older generation. So you might have used the Sorry, this is lagging. Okay, you might have used these vouchers before because we recently supported the Community Development Council, or CDC for short, in their two most recent nationwide campaigns where we distributed $200 to every Singaporean household. And so uh, just to share some history about um, CDC vouchers. So traditionally, these vouchers are usually distributed in the form of paper vouchers. And they were distributed to um, lower income households to spend at um, participating heartland merchants and hawkers. So um, typically, they were usually um, um, yeah, they were usually in paper vouchers, but the government wanted to increase um, the distribution of such vouchers to support residents during COVID times. And that's when they really started thinking about digitizing the experience so that we could let every Singaporean household um, use the vouchers. And so if you haven't used them yet, um, let me just share with you a snapshot of what it currently looks like. So if you click into the voucher link uh, to access your vouchers, you'll be able to click into the specific denominations you wish to use, and then um, a QR code will appear and you can show um, the, like the merchant that you want to spend the money on the QR code and then they will scan it using their app and then it will just be displayed as redeem. And so this is slightly um, unconventional in the sense that it might not be uh, similar to payment flows that you're more used to, for instance, like PayLa or Grab Wallet. Um, typically for those uh, user flows, you will take out the app, you will um, scan a merchant QR code and then you will key in an amount you want to use and then make the transaction. So you might be curious why we decided to go with this. And so for today, I'll be sharing the user research that my team did um, to lead us to this user flow. I'll be sharing how we got to the problem scope and the goals we wanted to achieve, as well as our prototyping process and share some thoughts about where we are today. 
So we typically take a very hands-on approach at OGP. So when CDC approached us to develop a digital solution uh, to support their nationwide campaign, we did an in-depth deep dive of how they were currently managing paper voucher campaigns. And through observation studies and conducting in-depth interviews, we realized that there are quite a lot of stakeholders involved in this whole like um, voucher management process. So the, um, the first stakeholder are campaign organizers. So these are people who typically handle the campaign setup and campaign management. The next stakeholders are op staff. So these are people who handle the paper vouchers collection from merchants, and then they kind of like bring these vouchers to CDC staff. Uh, the next stakeholder is finance staff. So these are people who do like the financial, financial reconciliation and make the eventual payment to merchants. And then we have residents like you and I who collect and use the vouchers. And finally, merchants who accept vouchers as a form of payment. And so everyone here goes through a really painful and lengthy process, but I will shorten it for you right now in the interest of time. So the first hurdle to overcome is that campaign organizers need to set up a campaign. And this really takes a um, really long period of time and even up to a year due to the high friction to operationalize a campaign. This is because they have to consider things like the voucher design and format, how to do financial reconciliation, um, figure out what's considered success for a campaign, and they have to co consider things like how are we going to actually distribute these paper vouchers. And so currently the most common distribution methods are either sending, um, putting in everyone's letterbox or asking the residents to come down to the CC to collect paper vouchers. Uh, now this is slightly problematic as you can see um, on the right side of the screen, uh, 229 sets of the CDC vouchers were stolen from letterboxes in 2020. And so what this means is that distributing paper vouchers are expensive because it costs money to print paper. It's risky because it's, um, it exposes the vouchers um, at the risk of being stolen, and it's labor intensive. Furthermore, for residents, um, needing to like head down to the CC to collect a voucher book, that's not a good idea, especially during COVID times. Um, and so overall, it's just a very labor intensive process. But after they finally managed to distribute the vouchers to residents, um, the residents will need to spend the vouchers at participating merchants. And this process is also pretty inconvenient for both um, residents and merchants. So from the resident's point of view, they need to bring down a voucher booklet whenever they want to use the vouchers, which is pretty inaccessible. Um, for merchants, they need to make sure that the paper vouchers are you know, kept very clean and neatly and not susceptible to water damage because um, especially if you're like cooking and washing pots and pans of your fish longer, it might be quite risky for you to know, like, just leave your paper vouchers anywhere. So they need to really make sure that it's kept properly. And furthermore, they need to manually count the paper vouchers daily or weekly, depending on their workflow in order to track their earnings. And after the paper voucher is being spent, there's a very, very tedious voucher collection process by the op staff. And this part was especially shocking to our team. So what the op staff does is that he carries a backpack, like the one you see on the screen right now, and he goes stall by stall to collect the paper vouchers from each merchant. After collecting each paper voucher from a merchant, they will then manually count it using um, that machine that you can see on the screen. And then they will tally it by writing down a record um, on that table, uh, on a piece of paper on that table. And so this is a very tedious process. And because it's so manual, it's also very prone to human error. And from the merchant's point of view, um, these vouchers are also collected on a weekly basis. So that means that if, let's say, you collect a voucher on Monday, you might wait until next Monday until you can actually like give this op staff your voucher. So you have to make sure in that one week you don't like damage or misplace your vouchers. And so the last step is a financial reconciliation where the op, st op staff will bring the paper vouchers uh, back to like maybe the CDC office. And um, the person doing finance will manually kind of like count and digitize these paper records and then finally make the digital payment to merchants. And so this is also very painful for merchants because they only get the money like two to four weeks since this process takes a pretty long time. So um, for merchants that are like smaller and like um, don't have that much business and rely on day-to-day -day cash flow, this is a pretty big pain point for them. And so overall, there were a few key problems that stood out to us due to the use of paper vouchers. Firstly, it's manual, time intensive and expensive. Secondly, it's prone to human error because so much of it is manually done. Thirdly, it's a hassle to merchants and residents to use. And this is especially difficult if you wanted to reach the skill of um, supporting nationwide campaigns. And so with this in mind, we set out to achieve some goals that we wanted to achieve with our solution. So for the campaign organizers, which includes the op staff and the finance staff, we wanted to ensure that we reduce the inefficiencies and costs typically involved in paper voucher campaigns. For residents, we wanted to make sure there was a convenient and simple way to collect and spend vouchers. And for merchants, we wanted to ensure that they will receive payouts quickly and were able to collect vouchers without hindering their job. So a lot of these um, 
kind of linked to design principles of being easy to use and efficient, um, which is pretty straightforward and, and clear as design principles. Uh, but a third principle, inclusivity, really threw a curveball at me. So we knew that existing recipients of CDC vouchers were mainly from low-income households and from the older generation. This means that some of them might not have access to smartphones and were less digitally uh, tech savvy. So while being inclusive could really mean a lot of things, I think for us, we just really wanted to make sure that no one, especially people who needed the vouchers the most, would not be left behind. And so in this case, we were extra mindful of making sure that the elderly or people without a mobile phone would still be able to use their vouchers as we begin this like, digitization journey. So at this point, I, I thought about my grandma, who really hates using a smartphone and insists that there's no way she can learn how to use it. But it was precisely, oh yeah, so I was really stumped as to how this could work out. But it was precisely this challenge that took us eight user trials and speaking to 700 residents, um, a lot of it were from the older generation, and a whole bunch of other stakeholders to get us to where we are today. And this process has taught me a lot, and I'm excited to share more about our prototyping process. So in OGP, um, we typically adopt the build, measure, learn loop process. So uh, the first stage is build, where we build a prototype to test our hypothesis of a potential solution. And then we'll evaluate um, this prototype with users and uh, think about whether it's successful based on certain metrics. Like for instance, the design principles I mentioned earlier. We, we might also evaluate like, if the hypothesis makes sense or if the prototype just makes sense to users. Finally, we take these insights and learnings and make decisions on what we should do next. So the team will think about what we should tweak in the next iteration, and we keep repeating this process again and again until we're very close to what we think should be implemented. And so for Redeem SG, we thought it was really important for us to be on the ground to get an understanding of how it was feasible to use in context. So our primary mode of testing with users was by conducting user trials, where we go on site to a physical location, like for instance a hawker center, to test the prototype with real users. And since we wanted to make sure that the elderly could use our vouchers, we also involve them as much as possible during our trial. And so this is often done in the form of guerrilla testing, as shown here, or even like a bigger scale trial, like a soft beta launch, where we release the product to a, a limited group of pre-selected people for testing. So for instance, before we launched our Redeem last year in December, we conducted a large scale trial where we invited thousands of residents across five cities in, in Singapore to test out the resident experience in participating merchants. But let's jump into the nitty gritty details and uh, let me share our own journey of prototyping the resident voucher experience. So I'll just be sharing the insights for some of the key trials that we did in the interest of time. And I'll share how we use the build measure learn process to help us finalize our solution. Okay, so trial one. With inclusivity in mind, one of the constraints that the team chose to have was not building a mobile app. This is because at the point of time, um, the CDC campaign was a one-off campaign so we, we weren't sure if residents would wanted to download an app for one-off things. We also knew that having an app would definitely just reduce adoption in general. So this was a constraint that we limited ourselves to. And so our main hypothesis was that residents could follow existing e-payment flows like Payla and Grab Wallet, but perhaps we could do it on a browser instead, like on Chrome or Safari. So this was the main flow we tested. Our residents were receive a voucher link and after clicking into it, they can indicate how much they want to use and then scan a relevant merchant QR code and then confirm the payment. So we went out to the hawker centers to test this flow out and discovered that many web browsers ran into camera permission issues when we use a phone camera from the web. And this is especially problematic on Android phones. And most residents were unable to troubleshoot these issues by themselves. And given that it was very difficult to ensure mobile, uh, reliable camera access without building a mobile app, um, we asked ourselves, what other ways can residents indicate which merchant they are making payment to without the use of a camera? And so this leads to trial two, where we constrained ourselves. Okay, if we don't use a mobile phone to identify the merchant that um, we want to pay to, then what could we do? So the hypothesis was instead of using um, a camera to scan a merchant QR code, we could instead ask the residents to key in a unique six-digit shop code to indicate who they wanted to make payment to. And so this is kind of what the trial looked like. There was a six-digit pin at a shop front, and residents will have to key in this code as well as how much they want to pay the merchant. So after testing this out, we realized that it was difficult for the digitally less savvy to ensure accuracy when it came to keying in a specific amount to spend, as well as um, to key in the six-digit code. So many of them were also very confused by the code because they thought it was a bank pin. And so this flow was not easy for them and very um, prone to errors. 
And we soon realized that this model of having residents key in how much they want to pay and who they want to pay to wasn't really working. Scanning a QR code or keying in six digits was just not as familiar as handing someone a paper voucher. And so we thought maybe it's best to keep things simple and that perhaps it wasn't the right time to go to a fully digital solution if we really didn't want to leave anyone behind. To reduce the switching cost of moving towards a more digital solution, we started experimenting with the idea of using paper vouchers, but finding a way to digitize the tracking of these vouchers so that things would at least be easier for the financial reconciliation part. And so for the next trial, we constrained ourselves again, no digital vouchers, let's revert back to paper. But the hypothesis that we wanted to test was, perhaps merchant can scan the paper voucher upon redemption so that the next part of the user journey would then be digitized. So here's what we did. We gave residents um, a paper voucher with a QR code on them, and in order for the merchant to accept payment, they would scan the QR code using a Redeem SG app. So given that the target group of paper vouchers were typically low-income families and the less digitally tech savvy, this was obviously the flow that they were most familiar with. And so this trial is largely a success. And this really goes to show that actually integrating low tech touch points with our digital systems might actually be fruitful. And building tech for public good doesn't always have to be building an app. However, the hassle of distributing paper vouchers was still apparent and costly. And since we knew that merchants could scan the QR code of paper vouchers, we wanted to push things further and began toying with the idea that perhaps we could create a digital equivalent of these paper vouchers with QR codes. And so that's exactly what we did for the next trial. We hypothesized that if we gave residents a voucher link that opened up the screen that mimicked a paper voucher in denominations, it would be intuitive, intuitive to them how to use it. And so here's what the flow looked like. You would click on it, it would, um, the screen will appear something that looks very much like a paper voucher. And when you show it to a merchant, it will indicate redeemed. And so we tested this out again, and we learned that residents and merchants generally knew what to do to spend and accept vouchers. Which means that uh, merchants scanning the QR code as a way of making payment works. We also realized that the use of fixed denominations will also significantly reduce the errors when it came to accurately selecting how much to pay a merchant. Another big bonus of this flow was that we will be able to support paper vouchers rather seamlessly. So that means that we can accommodate people who might not have a digital phone. Since both paper and digital vouchers make use of the same mechanism, meaning that like, if a merchant receives a paper voucher, all they have to do is scan. If a merchant receives a digital voucher, they will also need to do the same thing, which is scan. Uh, we thought that it was a huge bonus that uh, merchants will only need to learn one workflow, regardless of what kind of vouchers. And so we were very um, incentivized to proceed on with um, this model of accepting payment. However, something that we realized with the previous prototype was that it was not, it was not very efficient and swiping was not very intuitive among the elderly. Um, and so our next steps was to really increase the efficiency of spending more than one voucher at once. And this led to our final prototype where we wanted to test if residents would be able to kind of like select multiple vouchers before showing the merchant a voucher QR code. And so this was kind of the eventual prototype that we tested with that enabled residents to select more than one voucher and then show the voucher QR code to a relevant merchant. And it was really um, successful as um, most residents knew how to use it. And we also knew that it could accommodate residents of varying levels of tech literacy through a streamlined workflow for merchants. Like for instance, if someone went to the CC to print out their paper vouchers, mer merchants can treat it the same way as someone who presented them a digital voucher. So after deciding on the flow, we made a lot of refinements to the UI, uh, but the three key things were that we increased the font sizes so that the elderly would, uh, would be easier for the elderly to see what they have to do. Um, we also discovered that many people from the older generation were more comfortable with their mother language and uh, mother tongue, sorry, and couldn't speak um, English very well. And so we translated all of those into four national languages. We also observed many times during trials that citizens had um, this thing called display zoom mode on, and this enlarged like all the components that we used, and so we also fixed that. And through this experience, I've grown a lot more sensitive about to what it means to be designing flows for extreme users. And, and it's been incredibly challenging, but it also encourages me to continue doing the work that I do. And it ties in very well with what I think it means to be designing tech for public good. Um, yeah, so what does it mean to be designing tech for public good for, for myself? Um, so I'm really grateful that it means that I'm given the time and energy and space to optimize the user flow for the elderly, just based on the principle itself that we want to do our best to make sure we don't leave anyone behind and to ease our transition into a digital economy. 
I think that if I was working for a for-profit company, I'm not sure if I'll have the opportunity to work on such challenges. Oftentimes, designing for the extreme user also means making certain trade-offs. Like for instance, so many people ask me, like, why don't you just have a voucher wallet, but you can select a specific amount that would be so much easier for residents. Um, but I realized that actually designing for an extreme user can also mean you end up with a flow that works for that particular group, but also everyone else, and that can produce significant results. For example, um, the clicker is not working. <laughs> X on the keyboard. X. The keyboard is a is a Zoom sharing. Though. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> well, okay, I was, I was talking about um, making significant impact. So to date, about 98% of households have claimed their vouchers for the December 21 campaign, and 94% of uh, households have claimed their vouchers that was released in May 2022. And in total, we have supported about 221 million transactions. But beyond numbers, designing tech for public good also means that I get the chance to talk to people from all walks of life. And in some weird way, it makes me feel really grounded. If someone told me that my job requires me to talk to random strangers in hawker centers, or that I'll try to talk to a lot of like, people from the older generation with my broken Chinese, or that I'll get mistaken as the uncle who tells you to return your uh, tray back to like um, the tray return station at the coffee shop, I would have been quite shocked. But I also really enjoyed this entire process. And it feels really great to know that my team and the people around me care equally about these things. Most of the time when we go down to do trials, my team of engineers and PMs will join me, and designers who are not even on the same product as I am will also come along. Or things like, for instance, translating everything into four different languages takes up way more time and engineering effort, but we're happy to do so because it means that more people will be able to use their vouchers. And so here's where I'd like to give a big shout out to um, my team, which is um, the FinTech team. So we also work in other payment related places in Singapore, and also a big shout out to all the designers who have helped us along the way, including designers who have since left OGP. And with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. Once again, it is not working. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Karina, for sharing your thoughtful process that went behind the design and the nationwide rollout of Redeem SG. I love how your team conducted on the ground research yourselves using prototypes during the product development process. And if you are keen to learn more, catch her after the session in the Q&A. And next up, we warm welcome for our next speakers, Stacy and Kalida, who will be presenting on Scam Shield's efforts to fight scams, messages, and calls. Okay, hello. Is the audio good? From the back. Okay, hi everyone. I I'm Kaleda, and with me I have here is uh, Stacy. So um, I'm a product designer um, in OGP, and I've been on the Scam Show team since February. Uh, I'm Stacy, and I've been at OGP since February. I'm on the Scam Show team and Forms team. Yeah. So today oh. we'll be sharing more about um, the design efforts that we have on Scam Show. So if you've read the news uh, last year, you'll know that this happened, like the OCBC scams happened and a lot of people um, lost their money or even life savings to the, this particular scam. So scammers would pretend to be, scammers would pretend to be OCBC and they would send uh, their targets uh, messages containing like a link and then they would like use this link to log into the account to steal all of their uh, money. And on OGP's side, like uh, the current solution that we have was that we currently had an iOS app that was built in 2020. So this was actually started during our annual hackathon. And how it works is that it would block scam calls and filter scam SMSs. So let's say you have uh, a non-contact, someone like you didn't save, a non-contact sends you an SMS. 
the app will uh, read it and if it de determines it to be a scam message, it would like silently filter it into the junk inbox and you would like kind of never know that you receive a scam message unless you explore that uh, junk inbox. So you can see here that uh, this was actually filtered by ScamShoe with the little line below. Yeah. So the team was fully aware that this was the space that um, we were kind of operating in. We have ScamShoe for iOS, which helps uh, which kind of helps some scam SMSs and uh, block some scam calls. But we also knew that this was the channel available to scammers. So you can see here, like there's a vast um, different platform, communication platform channels that uh, are still targeted by scammers. And so we knew like this was an area that we needed to explore and find out more about. So we started off by doing some user research. Uh, we did survey and chats with users our goals were to find out um, what do we know about scams, what do we know about people who encounter scams, what do we know about uh, people who have fallen for scams, and why don't people actually report scams. So we chatted to a total of um, 19 people, and some of our findings were that uh, users were asking us, like, is there a place to report scams? And for this particular user, like, for this person, like, knowing where to go is probably the most important thing for them when they receive a scam. So a quick Google search would, uh, like where to report a scam would show these results. So you can see there's numerous resources here and for the public, it could potentially be confusing when there's uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of results. Yeah. Another thing we found out was that people actually Google to see or to check if it's a scam. And uh, another user also said like they trust community um, or crowdsource type of information. So like for this person, uh, Reddit is their first source of information and they feel that people are more aware on uh, forums. So the approach the team took were that we wanted to really have a community-driven strategy across the other communication channels. So if you remember this diagram, like this was the space we were at and this was the space that's available to scammers and we knew that our first step was to actually um, kind of help people who uh, who are like Android users because we know that uh, we only had iOS and also like the app could only do so much it could only um, currently help uh, scam SMSs as well as calls and we wanted um, the community to really come forward to report scams that were happening on the other channels as well. So I think today we'll be sharing about um, our efforts on scam show for Android as well as uh, the scam show bot that we're working on. So I'll start by sharing like how the team developed ScamShow for Android. So if you remember, this was the current solution we have for iOS. Uh, like it suddenly works in the background to filter scam SMSs. And I think the challenge was that um, for Android, due to the um, technical limitations of the Android platform, uh, it wasn't possible to like silently, silently move or silently filter a, a scam message into the junk folder. Instead, what we knew was um, technically possible was to send a push notification to alert users when they have received a scam SMS. So we also had no idea like how users would respond to this. Uh, so one of our assumptions was that like there would be too many notifications for users. Like as you know, like uh, a lot of us use various apps, so we receive notifications throughout the day. Uh, so we would like we were assuming that notifications would be annoying, but also at the same time, like uh, we would, the team was under a lot of external stakeholder pressure to deliver something for Android users. And there was also a lot of public demand to have something up for Android. So, but I think the team really like took the time and space um, necessary to craft a solution. We wanted to validate if this was something that was actually useful uh, for public. So we set off to find out um, what users thought about the push notification. And we did a trial. So we reached out to 100 participants and out of 100 of them, uh, a total of 61 of them Android, installed the Android beta. Our objective was like, um, in order to test if push notifications work, we had to send users scam SMSs. So if you recall, the notification works, uh, it sends alerts, as in it sends notification to alert users when they receive scam SMSs. So the approach the team took was that in order to combat scammers, like the scam show team actually became scammers. And we sent users five fake phishing SMSs over the span of two weeks. <laughs> we got them to sign a form and we clearly stated we'll be releasing fake phishing SMSs for testing purposes. And they had to like click the checkbox before they could submit the form, of course. So 
So the team also took the time to craft um, scam SMSs. So if you think about uh, an SMS, typically there will be like a sender name as well as the message body. And in this message body, for some of the messages, we actually put in a unique link. So we wanted to find out like, hey, if the if the app is sending you a notification telling you this is a scam, will you just still click into that unique link? Some of our messages look like this. So we have a, we pretended to be like a bank called Digital Pay, very sus, and then there's a unique link. <laughs> and we also pretended to be like an investment uh, company saying like, hey, we've received your application, check your balance here, and then a uh, unique link. And we also pretended to be like one of the most common scams, which is like puzzle scams. Yeah, and I think for this particular one, it was actually quite challenging because our SMS got blocked by the platform a couple of times. Yeah, and I was panicking and I was like telling my engineer, what's wrong, I can't send out this SMS. So she helped me troubleshoot it and we eventually found out it was like due to the sender name. <laughs> so we had to change it to something that looked a bit like uh, less scammy looking. So we just went with GoPuzzle in the end. So like the team, I think the team realized like, oh my God, it takes, actually takes a lot of effort to try to scam uh, someone. Out of <laughs> it takes a lot of effort to like craft these messages, find users to target, like find a name that looks somewhat legit. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then we collected the results in uh, Google Sheets. So you can see like some of the tools we use here in OGP are quite scrappy or like, uh, they're very collaborative in nature. So, um, you know, testing is usually is like very quick and scrappy. So everyone can work on this sheet and have visibility across the entire team. We also chatted to users um, over Zoom to find out more about how the Android trial went and what we could do to improve. So I think a minority of users said that they felt it was too many notifications, uh, which was somewhat expected. Like we went into the trial having this assumption that people would feel there's too many not notifications. So some users say they would just swipe, swipe it away, continue what they're doing, and uh, yeah. So I think something surprising was that a majority of users was, they actually like having the notifications. So some reasons for this was like, they feel the app was working. So they feel like uh, great because the app is working and it makes them feel confident and more safe about the messages that they're receiving. So it has a lot of like um, psychological safety for them as well, having the app. Uh, some of them also said that they actually feel safe, uh, that they feel it's reassuring, like someone is out there looking out for them, flagging suspicious things. And I think this was really heartwarming to hear um, as the, uh, from, the, from the team, yeah. So we set off to pursue our Android journey and here's a pic I took. <laughs> like what, we, were, we were trying uh, on numerous uh, Android phones in the office. Uh, like it was really a team effort to try out on whoever we knew had an Android, like whatever phone we could find in the office. Yeah, at what point in time, like this was the scam shoe spot. It just looks like some having handphone shop here. <laughs> we're like, trying to dig out with the engineers uh, a lot. And we finally launched scam shoe for Android. So, <laughs> this is us with the ASC team at this camp command center. So we definitely couldn't have done this without our partners from the Singapore Police Force. And we also went on a little poster hunting. So we knew that a lot of marketing materials were going out to get uh, the public to download or try out scam show. So we could see the ads on like MRT stations, uh, bus stops, even like below my block. Yeah, so it was like quite cool to go on a treasure hunt to, to like try to find all the scam shoe posters around Singapore. And I'm showing this pic because this was a photo I sent to my family group chat. Uh, you can see like this was the day of the launch. I said to my parents like, today's launching on Android and it's for my mom and my dad. And sure you can't see, but my mom like read with a sticker heart, like her new favorite thing is stickers. So like, I think uh, one thing um, designing for public good it means to me is like sometimes the users are really your closest like family your friends your loved ones people you know like even people in the audience i know they've helped us with our scam show uh trials yeah there's i think people online as well who has helped us yeah so it makes the work you do in ogp really meaningful when you know like this is uh, something that's useful and as of 5th december we've had 124k downloads for android Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so if you remember this
this diagram, this was the space we were at, but now we have iOS and Android. <laughs> <laughs> So I think the, the team is really happy, but we know like the apps are only a stopgap and not the end solution. Like there's still a lot more that uh, we can do and we should do for scams. And so we really want to push people to report more scams to help to keep the community safe. And uh, that's where the bots come in. So I'll hand it over to Stacey to share more about the bots. Thanks, Kalida, for sharing about Scam Show Android. So we know that the Scamshield apps help to detect scams, but there are still some scams that will fall through the cracks. So for those, we need people to report them, and that's where the Scamshield bots come in. So I'll be sharing more about how we design the bots to encourage reporting in the community. So before diving into the bots, let's talk a bit more about why we need the public to report scams. So the quote on the screen was taken from a recent Straits Times article on Singaporeans not reporting scams, and it also perfectly summarizes some of the sentiments that users have towards reporting. So when we spoke to some participants during our exploratory research, we found that many of them have been exposed to so many scams that they have become apathetic towards it. So they feel that it's pointless to report scams when they receive one almost like every other day. So what we want users to understand is that even though they have not fallen prey to a scam, it is still very important for them to report it because it has a wider impact on the community. By reporting scams, the authorities will be more aware of the severity of the problem and they will also be able to quickly identify new trends and tactics that are used by scammers. Okay, so now we know why we need to report, but why did we choose bots as our reporting channels? So why not a website or an app or even just a form, right? So, Kalida shared earlier that one of our research findings was that people didn't know where to report scams. And what you can find online is very confusing. So this was why we chose to develop our bots on WhatsApp and Telegram. So developing on these platforms meant that many people would have access to reporting channels as both of these are very common communication platforms and people already have them in their phones and also use them quite regularly. So this reduces friction in reporting and keeps the bots as reporting channels at the top of people's minds. So while our bots can be accessed conveniently through Telegram or WhatsApp, we still needed to design a experience that motivates people to report. So currently reporting is viewed as something pointless and troublesome. How could we change that? So introducing our bot, it's called Oscar. So Oscar stands for Official Scam Shoe Checker and Reporter. Shout out to our awesome UX writer Shanti who came up with this name. <laughs> so Oscar allows you to report scams and also check if something is a scam. So there are many kinds of chatbots out there, right? But we chose to build Oscar as a more like guided chatbot where users go through the flows using buttons. So here's a snippet of how Oscar works. A user sends the trigger message and Oscar replies with a message accompanied by buttons. So let's look deeper into some of the ways we designed Oscar to encourage reporting. So we realized from our user test that setting the tone for Oscar was crucial in influencing how users felt while reporting. Making Oscar sound human was important to make the process more delightful. And for Scamshu's case, we needed to strike a balance between sounding human, but not too casual, and at the same time sounding firm, as scams are still overall a serious topic. So when we first started out, this was what Oscar sounded like. We had thought that providing clear and concise instructions would be the way to go. We didn't really give much thought to the tone of Oscar. So during our user test, participants point out that it sounded a little too cold and robotic, which made the reporting process stale and a lot less incentivizing. So we explored various ways to make Oscar more human. So this was where UX writing became really important to set the tone. Shout out to Shanti again for working his magic on Oscar. <laughs> so first thing was to make use of emojis as they are perceived as more casual. So a lot of our messages included emojis and uh, our advisory as well so that we can appear more friendly. So we also used a conversational tone in our messages to keep things lighthearted. So filler messages like jotting down your report when Oscar is processing information really actually delighted our users a lot during the test. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison between Oscar's tone when we first started and what it is now. So we can see that setting the right tone really makes a huge difference in how a user will feel when they're reporting. So by introducing this human element, we hope that we can spark some joy when users are reporting scams. 
So besides giving Oscar a more human personality, we found that validation was also a key motivator to reporting. So people wanted to know how their actions have contributed in the fight against scams and that their effort has paid off in some way. So we also felt that we should recognize the user's efforts because after all, they were reporting out of their own goodwill. So we looked into parts of the user journey where we could give users this validation. So like how we made use of copy earlier, we also use copy to validate our users. So we use phrases like good catch to when a user checks if something is a scam. And when a user completes reporting a scam, we tell them their impact on the community. And we also tell them nice job for being the first to report a particular scam. So we use a lot of positive phrases, words and messaging to acknowledge a user's actions and hopefully this will motivate them to report more. Another thing that we introduced was the element of social proofing. So circling back to one of the quotes in our user interviews, we realized that people trusted and looked out for other people's opinions when it came to scams. So when people search up something to check if it's a scam and they see Facebook comments or Reddit threads from others, they tend to actually believe it. So with this finding in mind, we tested this concept in Oscar. So from the screen above, when the user checks if something is, they receive is a scam, they also know how many other people reported the same scam. So this gives them more reassurance and users have said that seeing the numbers actually encourage them to follow suit and report the scam. So the last thing we did was to provide users with an alternative flow to reporting. So when we first designed Oscar, we wanted users to copy and paste their scam content for reporting. We were under the impression that copying and pasting was something that uh, many people were familiar with. And it was not only when we conducted our Guerrilla user testing, when we realized we made a wrong assumption about that. So here are some quotes and thoughts from users when copying and pasting. So there were users who did not know how to copy and paste and prefer not to for very legitimate reasons. It was very interesting because users of all ages struggled. And for me, because I copy and paste stuff on a regular basis, I was not aware of these issues at all. So from this feedback, it was clear that we had to come up with an alternative flow to submitting reports so that more people could submit reports smoothly. So we included the option of submitting a screenshot. So here's how the flow will look like if users are submitting a screenshot. So when the screenshot is sent to Oscar, we use optical character recognition technology and extract the contents and create a report from there. So by introducing this flow that reduces work on the user's end, we hope that they will be more motivated to report and more groups of users can report smoothly. So here's a summary of how we encourage reporting through our board. There were many considerations when designing Oscar. What I've covered today is just a few. If you would like to know more about like the nitty gritty behind designing a chatbot, you can approach me later. I'll be happy to share more. So what's next for ScamShield? In the following months, we are looking to launch Oscar to the public on both WhatsApp and Telegram. And while we've been working on the apps and Oscar, we have also been working with the Singapore Police Force to build an internal dashboard where reports from the apps and Oscar will flow into. So this was actually a really fun tool to work on, but we cannot share here. Yeah. And after all that is done, we are looking to launch a public website that will allow reporting as well as house future features. So the ScamTrip team is also interested in chatting with anyone about their experience with scams. So if you know anyone who might want to share, feel free to reach out to us via the email on the screen. And here's a shout out to the ScamTrip team for working hard these past few months in the fight against scams. So coming back to designing for public good, it oftentimes means working on widespread problems that affect people across all demographics. So this means that the problem you work on will have a vast impact across the community, on yourself and on your loved ones. And that's why when we design in OGP, we actively involve the community in designing our solutions. So designing for public good really is meaningful work where your impact extends through the community and is felt by those around you. And that's all for our talk. Thank you guys for listening. We hope we have given you a picture of how design is like in development. If there are any questions about Scamshare and the work we have done, feel free to ask us. Thank you. Okay, just getting my reading glasses. <laughs> just kidding. Um,
Thank you so much, Stacey and Kalida, for sharing your work for Scam Shield. Um, as Zoe just put in the chat, uh, I also like to apply as a senior scam content designer, please. Uh, placebo scam messages is like the best content design opportunity. Um, so again, please direct any of your questions in the pigeonhole as we go into the next segment of our Q and A. Q and A time. Yeah, Q and A time. Just giving a few moments for um, Chloe. everyone for submitting so many questions. Um, we'll start off with maybe the most voted questions first. So um, on top, how do you at OGP decide on which problems to work on? Where does the request come from? Or how do you decide on your own? Yeah, I, I can answer this one. Um, as an organization, like our, our, like I was saying earlier, our, our, our big motivation is having like the most impact that we can on the most amount of people. Uh, and so that's usually like a determining factor for like, where do we staff things? What problems do we work on? Uh, it's where we believe we can have the biggest impact. Uh, and that is a bit of a fuzzy metric. Uh, and so it looks a little bit different, um, you know, year over year, month over month, because sometimes like the nation has different needs, right? Like the, when, when COVID happened, we shifted a bunch of resources over to work on uh, all the vaccination stuff for, for the COVID and uh, when all the scam shield stuff happened, we shifted a bunch of, uh, bunch of resources over, over in that domain as well. Um, so it's really like depends where we, where we think we can have the biggest impact. Uh, so a lot, we have like eight or nine products that are active development. But there's a lot of stuff that we've kind of like tabled that we pulled resources off that's just kind of in maintenance mode. Um, in, in terms of like where requests come from, there's a, a variety of places. Uh, we have like a partnerships team that works with uh, a lot of different agencies around government, identifying like teams that are, are open to working in a new way, teams that have impactful problems to work on. 
Uh, and then every year in January, we have our OGB hackathon. It's like a month long hackathon. And so a lot of the products uh, that you saw there actually came up and out of that, that hackathon. Uh, so they started as like little MVPs and we found like a, a single agency that was interested and uh, we got started there and things kind of grew from, from there. Thanks so much for sharing, Ben. And also after the session, um, you can also refer to, uh, I think you're looking for um, open, like you have, you have an open call for hackathon ideas or January? Uh, yeah, correct. Uh, so we have our hackathon coming up in January. Uh, I think on our LinkedIn, we just posted like a like recently about our open call. So if you have ideas about problems in the public space that uh, you're interested to see people work on, uh, please submit them. Yeah. Yep, sounds good. Thanks for sharing. And uh, we'll also share the links after this. Um, so next question. Um, so designing for public good, um, like what are the success metrics like? Like how do you measure success? And maybe you could share some of the metrics that you've used, maybe for Redeem SG or um, Sam Shield. I think generally for, I think it depends from product to product. So for Redeem SG specifically, we look at on the number of voucher claims. So that is people who have gone through the sign up flow successfully, and that means that a voucher link has been sent to them. And then on top of that, I think a bigger thing that we look at is also total number, uh, volume of transactions that we've supported. So that means that people have actually spent the voucher and it's like um, in the hands of a merchant right now. I think as we move, um, but as we scale, definitely there'll be different kinds of metrics. For instance, like CDC um, targets everyone in the nation, but we also want to like maybe target more specific groups of people so uh, for instance, like maybe like specifically low income households, uh, specifically like single parents. I'm just listing random ideas. So. <laughs> there are no such I mean, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> don't want to make any false promises. Uh, so then the metrics will naturally change there, like to maybe like for the number of people um, that are like specifically from this demographic. So, but for now, those are the key, uh, the two key metrics that we're looking at, but um, it will definitely change as we scale. Okay, so I think for Scamshow, it's a bit trickier because we can't uh, we can't say that because of the app, like we help protect citizens from X amount of scams. So it's not a direct like uh, cause and effect kind of thing. So I think for us, the metrics maybe would come more in the form of like how many people are how many people are actually sending in reports and uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so for, for the bots as well, it's the same thing. So we'll like some of the metrics that we have are like the focus on like user experience, whether people complete their reports or not, when people drop off, like how many reports come in through the bot. Yeah, so this is how we monitor whether like our solution like works. Yeah. I think something else interesting is that a lot of products in OGP also kind of measure it based on how much money we save the government. So for instance, <laughs> so for instance, like um, if a product um, helps prevent an agency from signing like another contract with a vendor that expects a ridiculous amount, uh, that's a that's a success metric for, for us. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, we also have a lot of interest um, from the audience about what you look for. Some look for in someone who's interested in joining OGP. I mean, you can share. Uh, yeah, for me, I think a lot about like passion and, and initiative. Uh, so folks who like uh, are able to like identify where there's like a gap or a problem and don't just like point at it and say like there's a problem there, but that take that next step of like trying to then solve that issue or find the resources of the people to to help you solve that thing. Um, I think passion is another one. Like uh, folks who have like already started like putting some effort in the, the public space. Uh, so those are some of the things that we look for. Again, at OGP today, uh, we're currently hiring at like our, our lead level and uh, I'm looking for a buddy, another product design manager to, to hang out with day after day. Um, so, uh, but across uh, government as a whole, uh, just on Tuesday we had this whole of government uh, design hiring push um, and we had representatives from a bunch of different agencies and we've started to collate all these different uh, opportunities that exist all across Singapore uh, for UX designers, engineers, product managers. Uh, on the UX side, I went and looked at the listing the other day and there's some like really interesting ones that was like being a UX designer in the like the Singapore prison system or being like a UX designer at the National Library. Uh, so there's a lot of like really cool opportunities where you can have an impact on, on public good uh, beyond OGP as well. 
That sounds really great. And we also have a job board that um, you can take a look at after this, uh, if anyone's interested to apply. Also, for the in-person crowd, you can speak to Ben directly. Um, next up, in the private sector, there's always a push to build products by a certain deadline. How do deadlines for products like Scam Shield, which might not necessarily be sensitive, time sensitive, work? Because I handle these ones, you want me? <laughs> okay, so I would say that like our product is not representative of all the other products in OGP. Uh, like firstly, even though it's not time sensitive, like scams were really on the rise during that period. So we knew that we had to act fast, but at the same time, like uh, I think that's also another question about like, external stakeholders. So actually, I'll, I'll just address it here. So I think it's really taking like the taking the effort to try to negotiate uh, a reasonable timeline with your stakeholders making them understand the constraints you have on um, building the product and improving on it to really like just push out an MVP. Yeah, I, I can give a general one. Yeah, yeah I think uh, like I said, from, from product to product, there's gonna be like different timelines, different stakeholders. Uh, so like, you can use like maybe forms as an example. It's like a whole of government product, right? Uh, so we're not necessarily tied to a specific agency on that one. So that team's like very autonomous. They set their like own timelines, own milestones, those kinds of things. Uh, but they are taking inputs from uh, whole of government, from from uh, members of the public, uh, and prioritizing what they think is going to have like the biggest impact. Uh, there's other teams um, that I guess like redeems like an example where they have like. Uh, a tranche of vouchers is going to go out at a specific date, and so we had to like hit that timeline in terms of like when that voucher tranche was going to go out. Uh, so there wasn't like a lot of wiggle room in that. It was like announce the nation, and then that's that's the day. Um, I, I mean, back when uh, all the COVID stuff was going on, they were working on the, the vaccine operations and the, the vaccine app that was like super urgent, on fire. So it was like all hands on deck, and uh, I think we pushed that out in like two weeks. Um, so, yeah, it, it varies from product to product, and we do our best to kind of negotiate with our stakeholders when we can. Yeah, um, yeah that sounds great. Like about you know some of the projects that you've worked on, which you're able to respond to very quickly, but also like you have a longer timeline for some projects that like may not be so urgent, but you still would like to ship. Um, next. Uh, I'm going to like you know theme a bunch of questions together, which are probably around the user research process. So end to end, from deciding how you uh, select different sample sizes for um, you know this population, and then um, afterwards, like what does that look like for post launch feedback? Um, yeah, I think you've already gone through a lot of um, insight with like how you analyze the research, but maybe like before and after. Uh, so I think um, for Redeem, uh, we were very specific that like, we wanted to target like the older generation and also people who were more used to paper vouchers. So we kind of approach this in like two different ways. When we do guerrilla testing, usually like I, I can't be too greedy. If for instance it's all youngsters at a hawker center, I'm like okay, um, I, I I maybe I'll just test with two people today and I'll come back on time. Um, but most of the time, uh, we try to like I, I look for people who maybe like look a bit older. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like, I mean, it's really, I just have to eyeball it and my team has to eyeball it. Um, that's really the best that we can do because it's not like I can get demographics of passerbys who are going to be at the hawker center. Um, but another approach that we do is that actually um, a lot of the community centers um, um, with like grassroots organizations and grassroots advisors, they have a better intel in terms of like um, residents from um, that neighborhood that like are maybe like are less digitally savvy or someone who comes to the CC often to get help um, or someone who like maybe wants to um, do something digitally, but uh, need a digital ambassador. So they're more familiar with like the residents in their own neighborhood. And so what we do is that we tap on them and specify like, okay, maybe we want people who are uh, uh, less tech savvy, people who have used paper CDC vouchers before, or people people who uh, maybe like didn't use the digital vouchers for tranche one, but use it digitally for tranche two. So we can be a bit, bit more specific there, and they will like help us with recruitment. Um, yeah, that's mainly what, what we do. It's, it's quite like, I, there is no like method to it, it's just kind of like based on what we think is the best for that specific um, research uh, purpose. But uh, when it comes to like, um, I think there was a question about post launch feedback. I think actually because we have done so many user trials, we have heard most of this feedback before. So a lot of the trade offs that we made were intentional trade offs that we knew people would like to say. So for instance, a lot of people give feedback about um, 
why is it not a voucher wallet? Why can't I just specify that amount? And I think we do our best to comes out that, okay, it's because we want it to be as inclusive as possible. Um, there was also a lot of feedback about, they want, uh, people wanted like lower denominations, so they found it hard to spend $10 notes. Um, but from, from us, that was a decision um, because we wanted to encourage spending within like, uh, um, for instance, like, um, like uh, nail salons at the Heartland Merchants or like hair salons. Like there are also other merchants besides like, um, like your conventional like f and uh, that you maybe would spend lower denominations in. So we also wanted to encourage spending on, on the other side as well. Um, there's also like tech considerations, for instance, like if we give more $2 notes, that means that the QR code will become more dense and then scanners might not be, scanners might not be able to pick up on it. So it's uh, all about balancing all these different trade-offs and eventually we came up with a combination that we thought was the most suitable. Um, yeah, there are, there's a whole bunch of other feedback also, and some of which like, we do take into consideration. So for instance, like, I think people said that they found it really hard to identify which merchants to spend their vouchers at. And so for that, um, I think a few weeks after launch, we added, you know, I think a few, uh, like maybe like one of the days <laughs> after launch, we added like a link that made it more accessible for people to see where to spend their vouchers, yeah, where they can spend their vouchers. Yeah. How many people are here? Yeah, I, I would say it's the same uh, approach that we did on Scam Show actually. Like sometimes like you want a certain demographic, but you may not be able to get the numbers. So we really work uh, as much like as hard as possible to get the demographic that we want, but if it's not possible, then I guess like we kind of uh, we don't like stick strictly to it. And so for post-launch feedback, uh, yeah, we work closely with our product ops. <laughs> we work closely with our product ops, so they would typically uh, look through every user's feedback and then we, as in typically it's like product ops and designers like hardcore read all the user feedback like, to see like what users are saying, where we can improve on and would group this uh, feedback in. So I think for Scam Show, like a lot of it is that users expect it to be like a, like a super duper powerful app that will like, like uh, protect them from every single scam and across like platforms even or WhatsApp. So I think a lot of it is like user knowledge, not understanding that, hey, the app actually can't read like your WhatsApp messages, for example. Yeah. And I think another thing is like users really would uh, love to upload uh, screenshots of the report, which unfortunately we can't, we don't have right now on the app, but we do, uh, we are building it on the board at the moment. So um, yeah, it just takes a bit more work to um, kind of engineering effort to push this feature on the app. So we do read uh, almost all the feedback. Yeah. I'd say in general, we have like a bias towards getting things out into the world as quickly as possible. Uh, so we're not as likely to like go do like a two, three month research effort and then uh, align on an idea and get going. It might be like a couple of weeks, uh, do some exploratory research with a smaller group of people, get some of the data that we need to make some initial decisions build something, put it out in the world, see how it works, and then get more data from there. Uh, so I think you saw that in some of the work that Karina had done with that build measure with. Um, thanks so much for sharing. Um, as a segue into our next question, uh, you mentioned, uh, Kalia mentioned uh, product ops earlier, and uh, maybe you can describe like what that is, like how, what that collaboration model is like, um, because I've actually not heard of you know, product ops support is that include research um, and how do you collaborate as a team together? Jackson, you want to come up and answer something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no idea that I will be coming up to speak, but my name is Jackson. So I'm a product ops in OGP. Um, I think what Kalida mentioned, uh, I'm not in a scam shoot team, but I can roughly describe what the products would, in Scamshoe would do, right? So the app would go out and then um, users will always write in feedback, regardless like good feedback, bad feedback, or just general feedback, right? And it's our job to synthesize those feedback and really take a look um, from a perspective of our PM and our designer as well. So like in designer's case would be, um, for example, uh, our users is trying to find the help button, but they couldn't do it. So sometimes they will write email directly to like any support channel they could find then we will notice that, hey, why um, so many users are writing um, this particular feature that is like giving them problems, like they can't find the help button. And we will reflect the feedback to the designers to say that, hey, I think a lot of people are asking for help. Um, maybe 
uh, is it because the help button is not obvious enough or like why are they asking for help? Then we'll, we'll start to dig those issues one by one to really find out what they're trying to report for. Then we'll work with these designers on that. Yeah. So that's like the gist of it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jackson. Um, just a follow-up question. Does that work also include like, I mean, it sounds a lot like overlap with user research that you do? Uh, not really, but um, I think the user research part for designers would be to really dive down on like some set of questions they want to find out, right? But for us, it's more like we know that designer would do user research um, when there's a need to. So instead of them just starting up an interview, why not the product ops start off with some general questions just to filter through like what are they looking for? Then we can pass it to them and the process will be cleaner. All right, thank you so much, Jackson. All right. Um, so yeah, maybe we can also continue on to this on this question about um, what is the team structure like at OGP? Maybe what other functions, stakeholders that you have, and uh, how do product designers have influence? Yeah, we have um, a handful of different like functional domains in, in OGP. We have our, like product management, design, uh, engineering, product ops, and then we have like all our people team uh, and. In terms of like the overall like team structures for different products, usually we'll staff with like a single product designer, a product manager, and a handful of engineers. And so we kind of have these like small autonomous teams that are working on the different products across OGP. Um, what's the rest of the question? Oh, the question is about the team structure at OGP. Uh, yeah, and uh, what role does do product designers play? Uh, because of the way that we staff our, our projects, where we, we typically have maybe like one or two product designers on a team. They're really responsible for that like full like end-to-end -end design process so it could be starting at like recruiting users to putting together your like script for research going out executing the research pulling out the insights uh identifying like what those top problems are ideating prototyping all the way to high fidelity design so our folks are really like working across that that full spectrum uh and that's kind of like what makes the like we do a lot I've done a ton of hiring this year. I've looked at so many like resumes, and our, our bar is like quite high because we have to have folks that can work across the whole spectrum. Uh, so we're kind of a, a bit of a generalist. Uh, this last year, we, we did a bit of an experiment. We pulled in our first specialist, which is uh, Shanti, our, our UX writer. Uh, and this next year, we're looking at doing another experiment to bring in like a, a full-time uh, UX researcher to see how that will kind of incorporate in the team. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Um, so we have time for a few more questions. I'm just going to like skim over uh, some of the questions that maybe would have been answered throughout the talks, um, such as like you know metrics, etc. Um, maybe we can. Oh, so the scam shield look, 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 looks like a sneaky raccoon. Uh, I like that statement. It's not a question. It's just you know putting it out there. Um, maybe next question, um, maybe Stacy can take this. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you've experienced when working with government agencies? Uh, I don't know, maybe working at OGP. Uh, okay, I will speak uh, about scan shoes so, and also a bit about like, forms. So uh, one of the uh, biggest challenges when we work with uh, <laughs> we work with like um, agencies is also like understanding their workflows and then so when we were designing our dashboard it was a very complex workflow which we had to like have a lot of discussions with uh, SPF over and then uh, sometimes they will ask for like features that are like kind of nice to have but since we are like working towards an MVP we have to kind of like all those uh, nice to have features like take a back seat so we can't always like fulfill what uh, our stakeholders want. Yeah. And then uh, for forms, some of the uh, some of the biggest challenges is uh, sometimes you get like uh, angry users um, from like different agencies with different like use cases for, for forms. Like they want a feature that will really help them. But um, for us, we have to like, for as designers also, and we work like closely with the PMs as well, we have to like figure out if like, um, this feature is useful for every uh, everyone else cause forms is used across like all agencies right yeah so um we can't like always give in to the users and um so recently forms went through like a, a redesign so like we have a lot of like uh, post-launch feedback as well which we have to like 
collect and monitor and see like which ones are like appropriate for us to like do. We don't want to like go in, uh, go into this like um, cycle of like giving the agencies what they want when they like request for it. Yeah. Uh, so before I came to OGP, I worked out in the, the private sector. Um, and the thing that I've observed coming into the public sector is that the, the challenges of working with stakeholders feel very similar to what you'd experience in the private sector. It's like, it's all about like uh, building trust, uh, you know, getting people to embrace change, maybe working in a different way than they're used to, uh, and, and like having like clear expectations and clear communication. Um, a lot of times uh, folks will have this kind of like vendor mindset of like, I'm going to give you like this list of like features and you're going to build all 100 features. And by this time, right, you, if you didn't do it, then you didn't meet the contract. Uh, and so we have to kind of shift that mindset a little bit from like, it's not about the, the outputs, but it's more about the outcomes that we're able to achieve. And maybe we're able to achieve those outcomes without all 100 features, maybe achieve with like 15 features or something like that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, next, uh, we do have a more minutes for questions. Um, I'm just going to like highlight um, this question around like you know, design systems. But actually, I'm very curious about how OGP, like for the visual design that you know Redeem SG and Scam Shield has, like how did you decide on that particular type of visual design? Like is that part of the design system or um, something that you just like observe would work? And, like how did you decide? You know, for example, the colors or yeah. so. I think um, like the OGP design system that is used across products is relatively new to OGP. So like when a lot of these products first started, for instance, I think ScanShield started like in 2020. Um, I'm not sure whether that was a design system back then for OGP, I wasn't around then. But, uh, so all individual products have their own design system, if let's say the designer thought that it was appropriate to, to have one. So, um, uh, and I think a lot of us also like kind of like duplicated the forms design system because that was the first OGP product that really had like a solid design system with a lot of components. And so for Redeem, what I did was that I, I, I copied the forms design system. And then I realized that um, through user testing that um, for, for my product specifically, like I needed to increase the tech size a lot compared to like other products. And so that's when I sort of just like, okay, I'm going to build off my, my own design systems. And um, also a lot of products in OGP were not like mobile first. I think Redeem actually is one of the first few that was like mobile first as compared to a lot of agency facing like desktop um, kind of like uh, interfaces. So with that also came in like different component sizes. And so then I, I also like made a whole bunch of components that were more like mobile first friendly. And then eventually I added that into like, you know, I sorry, Pearly, who is our senior uh, product designer, added those components into like the main OGP design system. And I think it's, it's slowly, um, we're trying to build the OGP design system. So it's kind of like, Everyone who is building new components will still be to it. And now I think we have a pretty robust like, OGP design system that we try to, to, to use. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the, the question. You want to share a bit more about Scam Shield? Uh, OGP isn't that old. Like, we're yeah. like three years old at this point. A lot of the products aren't that old. The team was like, I don't know, Sarah, like what, three designers for a long time. Uh, so a lot of those like initial products, the products that you see now that are kind of like the flagship products, uh, haven't been around for that long and got started with like very scrappy small teams that were just kind of putting things together. Uh, and then more recently, like in the last year, we've started to like head more towards like some standardization across the different products. Uh, and we'll, we'll probably continue to head in that direction in the future. Uh, but it, it's just a matter of like things still being new, the company still being young. Uh, we just hadn't hit that level where it, like made sense to spend the time and effort to standardize across everything. Yeah, no, like localized? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the visual stuff, really, actually, I think most of us use like assets that you can find online. Uh, but for me, my challenge is that because like Redeem SG is such like a localized product, we're trying to encourage spending at hawker centers. It's like a lot of the graphics don't work. For instance, if I search like shop on like freepink.com or something, um, I get like a hot dog stand, which is like so not relevant to Singapore. So um, we've had to try to like sort of like build some illustrations from scratch um, or like, yeah. So uh, there's some attempts there, but um, yeah, I, I'm not really an illustrator, so <laughs> it's kind of like, like, uh, like we try our best and then we, we use graphics as much as we can. 
Um, but yeah, I think we're all quite intentional about making sure that the graphics are relevant and making sure that um, you know, like I include like elderly graphics in the sign up flow that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, maybe Ben, you could expand a little bit more about, you said that you're uh, planning on standardizing and building this design system. Um, what is that, uh, what's that progress look like currently? Yeah, so the way that we staff projects at OGP is like each designer will have their, their, their major project and their minor project. And the design system for a long time has been the minor project of a bunch of people. Uh, and only in the last couple of months, uh, one of our designers, we freed up enough bandwidth that they could take that on as their major project. Uh, and um, so they've been doing that for the last couple of months, all to get ready for our hackathon that's coming up in January. And that's where we're really going to try to like test the limits of that because there'll probably be like uh, you know, 20 plus different products coming up over the course of that month. Uh, and hopefully those teams can like pick up those components that have been designed in the design system try them out, uh, get them to work, even if their team doesn't have a designer. So that's, that's, our, that's our goal for that. All right, great. All right, time for one last question. Um, maybe anyone like from this list, uh, is there anything that stands out to you? Um, perhaps something around design process or uh, hiring? Uh, what do you feel like answering <laughs> to the panel? Uh, there's a question about like, do I have to get in by internship to be able to convert to a product designer in OGP? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, we, we have people come from all, all different backgrounds. Not, not everyone has come up in, in through an internship. Um, we do offer like anyone at OGP, like after they've been here for six months, has the opportunity to bring on an intern if they want to. Uh, it's really up to, to the individual. Um, when we run our internships, uh, we try to like make it uh, as advantageous for the, the intern as, as for us as an organization. Um, like we learn skills about like mentorship management, uh, and hopefully they learn a lot of skills about like day-to-day -day product design. Uh, we tend to follow this framework of like uh, I do, we do, you do, and so at the beginning of your internship, like uh, you're going to be kind of as a mentor, like leading things, showing them how things are done. About halfway through, you start to transition where it becomes a little bit more of a partnership. And then towards the end of your internship, uh, you're taking on a lot more responsibilities and you're operating as like a like an individual on, on the team. Uh, and so hopefully by the time that someone's internship is done, you know, if we have headcount, we'll have a, a, a conversion conversation. But if we don't, hopefully we set them up for success for whatever's next for them. Right. Thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have today for the Q&A. So uh, let's give a huge thank you to Ben, Stacey, and Julia. And as everyone has seen the research process at OGP today, I'm going to pass it over to Ben, who has a few words about it. Yeah, we, we have this uh... It's a telegram group, right? Yeah. Oh, yes, it's telegram it's group. group. <laughs> uh, it's called OpenGeo, and uh, it's like a pool of people that we've kind of collected in, in Singapore that we reach out to on a regular basis for surveys, for user research, these kinds of things. Uh, so if you're interested in kind of like, you know, even in a small way contributing, uh, you can fill out the form. Uh, yeah, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> you, you can fill out the form uh, and then We'll like send out surveys there, reach out to folks uh, for, for user research and those kinds of things. Uh, you can even pass it to your parents, your grandparents, uh, your, your uncles, your aunties. Uh, but, yeah, we really like to try to have a diverse group of people in there. Yeah. Um, sorry, regarding that, could you, uh, since you guys have all of our emails, could, could you just send like a, a link to that to our emails so that we can we won't, like, lose track of that? So yeah, possible? sure, we can send an email to the audience. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ben. And before we end the session today, uh, before we end the session online, um, if you're hiring or exploring your next opportunity, please check out the job board on Figma. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today, both online and in person. That's an official wrap for Friends of Figma Singapore's last event of 2022. Stay tuned for what's coming next in 2023 and join us on Discord until then.
And for everyone here in person today, feel free to stick around and mingle. There's so much pizza left, um, so please have some. Yeah, please eat, please eat the pizza. I used a pizza calculator online, and uh, it grossly <laughs> overestimated. So help yourselves, take some home, whatever. You can.